You're in the uh, BitFlow track, and our next speaker is Gabby Nakibli. He's going to be speaking on owning the routing table, new OSPF attacks. OK. Hi, everybody. So uh, as he said, uh, my name is Gabby Nakibli, and I'm going to present some uh, new OSPF routing attacks, which allows uh, a remote attacker to remotely uh, control the routing table of another router without actually having to control or own uh, the router itself. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Alex Kirshon and uh, Dima Gonikman. Before I begin, just a quick introduction about myself. So again, uh, my name is Gabi, and I'm a net network security researcher at a place called the National Electronic Warfare Research and Simulation Set Center. It's part of a larger organization called uh, Rafael, which is an aerospace and defense company located in Israel. And uh, our lab does high-end research and consulting services uh, for organizations that uh, want to better defend their information assets and networks. I also serve as an adjunct researcher and uh, lecturer at the Technion. Let's begin with a general overview of what you're going to, uh, to hear. So I'm going to present today some newly found vulnerabilities in the OSPF protocol, which is probably the most uh, common or popular uh, routing protocol inside autonomous systems. Uh, as I said, the attacks allow uh, an attacker to remotely own the routing table of another router without actually having to control or own the router itself. This is, of course, very desirable for the attacker since he doesn't have to uh, get remote code ex execution on the remote router. He just has to execute uh, the attacks I'm going to present. And uh, why is this so desirable to uh, control the routing table? Well, um, uh, the attacker can do uh, many uh, neat uh, tricks with, uh, with the routing table. For example, it can divert traffic to non-normal uh, uh, routes. For example, to facilitate uh, eavesdropping, uh, man in the middle, impersonation, black holing, and so on and so forth. It can also uh, um, deny of service the entire, the entire autonomous system for the, by inducing uh, routing loops, network cuts. It can also deny of service a particular router. Uh, by overwhelming it with uh, traffic, and so on and so forth. The, actually, the, um, the examples are endless. Uh, an attacker that, that controls the routing, the routing tables of other routers actually control uh, the entire uh, routing of the autonomous system. So who is vulnerable to this attack? Uh, actually, uh, potentially, every commercial router on the market is vulnerable to the attacks you're going to hear today. This is because the attacks uh, exploit vulnerabilities in the OSPF specification, in the RFC itself. So every router vendor which uh, implemented this, uh, the RFC correctly is vulnerable to these attacks. And indeed, uh, we verified these attacks against Cisco's iOS latest and stable release and found out that indeed uh, Cisco implemented the, the vulnerabilities correctly. So. Uh, um, so how the, the attacks actually work and uh, why they are so different from known OSPF attacks you may already know. Uh, you may already know. Okay. So um, the attacks achieve control over uh, the routing tables of another router by, by uh, falsifying or controlling the router's view of the autonomous system's topology. Uh, this can be done by, by uh, falsifying uh, the routing advertisements of other routers in the autonomous system. The, the, the routing advertisements of other routers uh, are used uh, to compile the, the view of the autonomous system topology. So known attacks that uh, attempted to do this, to falsify the routing advertisements of other routers, usually encounter the, or trigger the fightback mechanism of OSPF. This is a, a relatively famous uh, mechanism in OSPF, which uh, says that if uh, a victim uh, router noticed that its, router ad uh, that its uh, routing advertisement has been falsified, it will uh, immediately spit out a uh, correcting routing advertisement, advertisement which will uh, cancel out uh, the false one. So this means that uh, all or practically most of known attacks that try to do this are, were non-persistent. The new attacks I'm going to present today evade this, uh, this fightback mechanism and allow uh, for a persistent and stealthy attacks. Okay, so let's dive into the presentation. Um, first, I'm going to talk about, about uh, the OSPF uh, basics, 
then point out the security strength uh, of OSPF, and why does it make the life of the attacker so much hard. Um, then the known OSPF attacks that already been published in the past, and then for the main course, the newly found vulnerabilities and attack. Okay, so let's start with uh, the big picture, internet routing, how it works. Well, the internet is uh, composed of, uh, is, uh, the internet is composed of uh, networks and routers. The networks and routers are, are clustered into groups which are administered by a single network operator, uh, for example, a university, uh, an ISP, a large corporation, and so on and so forth. Uh, these clusters, these groups are called the autonomous systems. There are some 35,000 autonomous systems scattered throughout the, autonom the, throughout the internet. And now this means that if I want to route a packet from A to B on the internet, the routing has to work in two levels. The first level is the inter-AS uh, path, which means I have to work out the, the path the packet will, uh, will take uh, at the AS level, the list of uh, autonomous systems the packet will traverse. This is done by an inter-AS routing protocol, which is commonly known as BGP. At, and the lower level is the routing inside each and every autonomous system, uh, which is done independently. This is done by uh, intra-AS routing protocols, uh, the, mo the most prominent examples of which are uh, OSPF, RIP, and ISIS. As I said, uh, I'm going to focus uh, on OSPF, which is probably the most common uh, routing protocol, uh, intra-AS routing protocol on the internet, certainly for enterprises. So how OSPF works? Let's see uh, an example. Let's say this is our autonomous system. We have a bunch of routers and networks connected to each other to form a certain topology. Now OSPF works by having a, a route, uh, the routers periodically advertise routing advertisement, which we call link state advertisements, or LSA for short. Uh, and uh, each, in each LSA, the router uh, tells us to which other routers or networks uh, is directly connected. And this LSA is flooded uh, throughout the autonomous system. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, R, uh, the LSA of RA is flooded throughout the, the network. Now, every router builds uh, a data structure called the LSA DB, which simply uh, is, uh, stores all the LSA it receives. So now every router knows that RA is connected on one uh, interface to net one and, for the ad and to the other to net B, to RB. Same goes for uh, RB, flooded throughout uh, the autonomous system, and now everybody knows that RB is connected to RA and these two, these two other routers, and so on and so forth. This is how every router forms its view of the autonomous system topology. Now, uh, in addition to the links, there are also costs associated with each, with each and every link. This means that RA tells, tells us that uh, it's connected uh, to RB and the cost is three, and the cost from RB to RA is two. Uh, based on this view and these costs, uh, the router now calculates the least cost uh, path from it to each and every other destination on the, on the autonomous system, and this is how a routing table is constructed. Okay, uh, now uh, let's talk about some uh, LSAs. Now, as I said, the LSAs are uh, periodically advertised. This means that a fresh instance is originated uh, by default every half an hour. And so in order for a fresh instance to run over an older instance, uh, we uh, use the sequence number. There's a sequence number in each LSA. And this is how uh, a new, inst a new uh, uh, instance of an LSA with a higher sequence number can run over uh, an old instance of an LSA with a lower sequence number. And there also is an, an age, an age field to, uh, to the LSA which uh, means that uh, uh, the age uh, is initialized uh, by zero, and then uh, continuously incremented as time goes by, and when the age reaches one hour, uh, the, simply is, uh, the LSA is uh, uh, removed from the, each and every uh, database. Okay. Um, and one, one other thing is the advertising links on a, a LAN. Now, OSPF uh, defines the following uh, uh, procedure for advertising links to a LAN. Each router first advertises uh, a link to the LAN itself, not to, the, uh, not to other routers uh, uh, which are connected to it. 
And in addition to that, um, uh, one, uh, design, one router is named the designated router of the LAN, and uh, it advertises uh, another LSA on behalf of the network itself, which advertises uh, links back to all the other uh, routers in the, that are directly connected to the network. And this is how uh, advertisements on a LAN, this is a transit network, uh, works out. Okay, so now how uh, can a, a router know who are its neighbors? Well, there is a simple protocol called the Hello Protocol, which uh, defined as part of the OSPF protocol. And uh, this is a fairly simple protocol that, uh, in which uh, every router just advertises uh, or broadcasts a, an Hello message on the, on the, on the local LAN. And this is how routers mutually discover each other. Now, uh, two routers, uh, two neighboring routers, which have now uh, discovered each other, uh, possibly can uh, now set up an adjacency between them. The purpose of an adjacency is to, have, to make sure that the two routers have ex the exact same copies of, the LSA, uh, of their LSA DBs. And now, no, uh, not every two neighboring routers set up this adjacency, only if one of them is a designated router or if they are connected over a point-to-point -point link. And uh, after they've set up an adjacency, uh, they can now uh, include in their LSA a link uh, to uh, the other router. Let's say an, an example of how, how uh, setting up an adjacency works out. So we have uh, these two routers, R1 and R2. They initially don't know one about the other. And R2, for example, sends out uh, the initial hello. It broadcasts it uh, on the local link, and the R1 uh, receives this uh, uh, broadcast. And then uh, when he, sa he sends its hello, uh, he's d it's claiming that uh, he uh, previously seen an hello from uh, R2. This is indicated in the neighbor field. Um, and let's uh, say uh, for our purposes that uh, the identity of uh, R1 is uh, numerically larger than the identity of R2. And now once R2 sees this hello, uh, let's assume that he decides uh, to set up an adjacency, for example, if R2 is the uh, designated router. Now, as I said, the purpose of setting up an adjacency is to make sure that the, uh, the LSA DBs of both routers have the exact same LSA uh, DB. Okay, the exact same uh, identical. They are identical. Uh, this is done by exchanging uh, the LSA summaries uh, in each and every uh, database. One router tells the other what are the, the LSAs in its uh, database. Now, uh, they exchange the LSA summaries using a special packet called the database description packet. The first sequence of uh, this, uh, or first exchange of this database description packet is called the master-slave negotiation. This is the initialization. Uh, you see here that R2 sends to R1 a database description with an I flag set. This means the, uh, this is an initial initialization of the master-slave negotiation. The M flag uh, means that I have more LSA summaries to send out. And the MS flag, which is uh, the most important here, means that R2 declares himself to be the master of the, of the exchange. I will talk about it later what does it mean to be the master of the slave. And then it uses just an, an initial uh, sequence number uh, for uh, the exchange. R1 does the same. Also uh, sends out his uh, database description with an IM and MS flag uh, set, meaning that he is also declaring himself to be the master and he uh, picks a totally different uh, initial sequence number. Now, uh, since in this example, uh, R1 has a higher identity than R2, and this means that uh, R1 is now chosen to be the master and R2 concedes to be the slave. Uh, and this means that now uh, the sequence number chosen by R1 is used throughout the exchange. And, then, and now R2 sends out another database description echoing the, the same sequence number R1 chose. And then R1 uh, proceeds with the exchange by sending his database description uh, with an incremented sequence. And then, and so on and so forth. This, is, this uh, continues until both routers tell the other, the other one all their LSA uh, content, all their LSA database content. Once they uh, are finished doing that, they can now see and, and, uh, and understand if uh, the peer has a newer LSA than they got. 
if this is the case, they can ask for, uh, from the peer um, the LSA by the LSA request, and they can get it back uh, using the LSA da update. Once this stage is over, now both routers have the same copies of the LSA DB, okay? And they are fully adjacent. This means that R2 can now advertise an LSA with a link to R1, and R1 advertises an LSA with a link to R2. Okay, this is very important. Let's move on to OSPF security strength. How long have time? Okay. The first uh, security strength is uh, the per link authentication, uh, which means that every OSPF packet which uh, is transmitted over a, a local link is authenticated using HMAC based on MD5. This is, uh, this is used, uh, uh, this is based on a secret shared by all the routers connected to that link. Um, this means that uh, if I want to send out a packet on the link, I have to know this shared secret. Uh, now, uh, since uh, OSPF did not um, define an automatic procedure to manage these secrets, network administrators are forced to uh, configure these uh, secrets manually in each and every uh, uh, router. Uh, which means that in many deployments uh, in autonomous systems, uh, these secrets are the same for all the links in the autonomous system, but it doesn't have to be that way. Another security strength is that each and every LSA is flooded throughout the network. This means that a single malicious router cannot stop, cannot block, or prevent an LSA from being flooded to other uh, routers as long as there is another uh, path that doesn't go through that uh, router, this malicious router. Okay, so in the gen general case, a malicious router cannot prevent an LSA from ever reaching other routers. The third uh, strength is the fightback mechanism I, I mentioned earlier. If an, a, a router uh, receives an LSA uh, that it is its own and it sees that it, it is falsified, it will immediately send out a, a fightback LSA, which means a correcting LSA with the right content with a higher sequence number, and this cancels, cancels out um, the, uh, the false LSA. Now, notice that the two uh, security strengths here uh, actually mean that it is very hard for an attacker to persistently falsify the LSA of another router. If it just uh, sends out the LSA over the network uh, because of the second bullet the LSA will eventually uh, re be received by the victim router, and this router will immediately uh, send out a fightback LSA, which will uh, immediately uh, revert uh, things uh, back to their normal state. So the, attacks are, the, the attack is not persistent. Another uh, uh, security strength is that one LSA holds only a small part of the topology. This means that even if an attacker somehow managed to persistently spoof or falsify the LSA of another router, it only managed to falsify only a small part of the, uh, the, the autonomous system topology. And hardly means that he gained uh, significant control over the router's view of the autonomous system uh, topology, and it hardly means that he gained significant control over the routing table of, uh, uh, of the victim routers. In order to do that, he has to falsify many LSAs by many routers. And the last uh, strength is that links must be, must be advertised by both ends. This is the bidirectional requirement, which means that uh, um, if a link is just advertised by a, a single end, uh, and not the other end of the link, then the, the link will not simply will not be, be taken into account during the routing ta uh, table calculation of the other routers in the autonomous system. This means, for example, the, that an attacker that simply advertised the link to another router uh, will not get any influence on the routing table calculation because that other router will never advertise the, uh, the opposite direction of that link. Okay, so this was uh, where the security strengths of OSPF. And let's talk about the attacker. Now, um, the attacker is assumed to be somewhere in the autonomous system. Uh, it doesn't have to be in a certain location or uh, it doesn't have to be very central or uh, well-connected, we assume that the attacker is somewhere on the autonomous system within an arbitrary uh, uh, location. 
Uh, this means that uh, he knows uh, the MD5 uh, secret of its directly attached links and only them, and not the other uh, uh, shared secrets of all the other links in the autonomous system. And the goal, as I said, is to control the routing tables of all the other routers in the autonomous system uh, without having to actually control that routers. So uh, before I present uh, um, the new attacks, let's review some of the known attacks. OK. Let's review some of the known attacks. Um, the first class of uh, attack, which is the most common uh, attack on OSPF, is the one that the uh, attacker simply advertises um, LSA on behalf of the router it actually controls. This is a very convenient attack vector since no fightback will ever occur. But this is, all, uh, this is also, oh, sorry. <laughs> Pause it. Uh, how much time again? It's not for now. OK. Thanks. Um, OK, so uh, this is a very uh, limiting attack vector, since actually uh, uh, one LSA, just one LSA, is falsified by the attacker. And that's it. So uh, one variant of the attack is actually uh, to falsify uh, the cost of an existing link to another neighbor. Uh, this is, of course, uh, kind of limited. Uh, it doesn't get the attacker very far. It can, for example, uh, uh, make the cost very high in order to repel traffic from it or make the cost very low in order to attract more traffic to it, but that's it. The two other variants of, uh, of the attack, of this uh, class of attack, is to advertise um, non-existing links uh, to networks outside the autonomous system or to stub networks inside the autonomous system. A stub network is a, is a network uh, with only one router connected to it. Uh, so no uh, fightback uh, can occur here. So um, this is, these two variants are actually uh, one-track tools, meaning uh, they, uh, they are excellent if the attacker wants to attract uh, traffic to it. Um, but uh, this is pretty much all uh, the attacker can do. It can impersonate uh, maybe other routers, uh, black hole traffic, but uh, it really will not uh, have a flexible control over the routing tables of other routers. This is not exactly what, exactly what we do, we want to do. And plus, uh, if the attack uh, is discovered, then it is very easy for the network administrator to pinpoint uh, the attacker since all the traffic is attracted to him. Another uh, variant of uh, the attack is to advertise non-existing links to transit networks or existing routers. Transit network is, is a non-stab network, meaning uh, more than one router is connected to it. Um, this uh, variant of the attack doesn't even influence the routing tables because of the bidirectional requirement. Uh, the existing router or the designated router of the transit network will never advertise a, a link back uh, to the attacker. So actually, the requirement is not met, and uh, the routing table calculation is not, uh, uh, is not influenced whatsoever. Um, another class of uh, non-attacks is uh, falsifying other routers' LSAs. This is a much more powerful attack. Uh, known examples are sequence plus plus, meaning let's uh, advertise an LSA with a higher sequence or with the maximum sequence. Um, all these attacks amount to pretty much the same consequence. Um, the victim router eventually triggers uh, the fightback uh, LSA which makes the whole attack uh, non-persistent and not very stealthy. There is one uh, attack that managed to evade fightback. Um, uh, in this attack, uh, the attacker simply sends out a high rate of uh, the false LSAs, uh, once every one or two or few seconds, relatively high rate. Uh, and it uh, actually exploits a vulnerability in the OSPF specification that, that mutes uh, the victim router by sending this uh, high rate of uh, false LSA, and uh, the router simply uh, cannot send out his uh, fightback LSA. But this is not very stealthy attack. Uh, you have to f send every second uh, the false LSA. Another category of, uh, of phantom router uh, of uh, attacks is impersonation of phantom routers, of non-existing routers in the autonomous system. 
in which case the attacker simply sends out an LSA on behalf of a router that does not really exist uh, in the autonomous system. This is good actually for just overwhelming uh, the database uh, of other routers with uh, garbage LSAs and that's it. Uh, it's not really good for uh, changing or influencing the routing table of other routers, again, because of the bidirectional requirement. The phantom router can advertise a link to another router, but that other router will never advertise a link back uh, to, uh, to the phantom. Okay. So in summary of the known attacks, it is the, the common conception today that uh, even if the attacker is uh, inside the autonomous system, and let's say uh, that he knows ev each and every uh, shared secret uh, in the autonomous uh, system, uh, he can't really uh, influence the routing tables of other routers. He can't really influence uh, or falsify uh, the LSA of other routers in a persistent way. It can do a lot of uh, bad things. It can uh, induce instability in the, in the autonomous system, but it can't really uh, um, cause damage in a persistent way. The new attacks you're going to hear today actually shatters these conceptions and uh, indeed achieve a persistent effect. Okay, so the new attacks are actually uh, two attacks. The first attack is a remote uh, force adjacency uh, attack which makes the router uh, advertised, uh, which makes another router advertise uh, a non-existing link to a non-existing router in, in its LSA. Uh, in a again, in a persistent way. This is the first attack ever that managed to do that, to make another router advertise a non-existing link. Uh, this attack assumes that uh, all the MD5 uh, shared secret on the, uh, in the autonomous systems are equal. This, uh, in many cases, is, it, it is the case, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, the other attack, it's a much more, much more uh, powerful attack. We call it uh, the disguised LSA. Here, the attacker can falsify the entire uh, LSA of another router, not just add, make him add another uh, link to a non-existing router, but simply falsify it from scratch. And it does not assume anything about the MD5 uh, shared uh, secrets. Okay. Okay. So let's begin with uh, the remote uh, force adjacency attack. Uh, this attack is based on the following uh, observation. A master router can successfully set up an adjacency with its peer without actually seeing the messages sent by the, the peer, the, the slave uh, router. Uh, this is derived from uh, this uh, section in the RFC. And let's see what, uh, how an attacker can exploit uh, this uh, vulnerability. So let's say we have uh, the victim router, which is the designated router on its, uh, on its LAN. Let's say we have, uh, they, he has uh, two neighbors uh, he already set up an adjacency with. And now the remote attacker can send out, uh, will, will send out false hello and database description messages directly uh, to the victim router. This is done using a unicast uh, message, simply send out and direct uh, uh, messages to the victim itself. Um, the messages appear as if it, it, they came from a phantom router located on the victim's LAN, um, and this way the attacker can convince the victim router he had just successfully uh, set up an adjacency with the phantom router, like so. And this means that uh, from now on, and this is the whole point of the attack. From now on, the victim router will advertise an LSA on behalf of uh, its LAN, on behalf of the network, which connects the network to the phantom router. Um, and this is, again, uh, this is the first attack that managed to do this in a persistent way. Managed uh, to connect uh, a real network back to the phantom router. And now this means that every LSA the phantom router will advertise, will be taken into account uh, while the routing table is calculated. Um, and this is the, the, the effect, uh, actual effect of the attack. For example, uh, the phantom router can advertise a link to a uh, non-existing subnet, and uh, all the routing table will be, uh, uh, will, uh, the calculation of them will be taken into account 
um, by this, uh, you, uh, based on this uh, LSA. So let's uh, see how the attack sequence works out. Uh, the actual details of uh, the attack. So every, attack, every packet the attacker now sends has an IP source address of the phantom's IP address. This is just a fictitious IP address, which is part of the subnet of the victim's LAN, okay? And the IP destination of each packet is the actual IP address of the victim. Again, all packets are sent in unicast uh, to, the, to the victim. So the first packet is an hello message uh, in which the attacker is identified, identifying himself as uh, the phantom uh, router. And uh, he wants to make sure that uh, the ID of the phantom router uh, is uh, larger than the ID of uh, the victim. Just uh, arbitrarily choose uh, a larger uh, identity than the ID of the victim. And uh, the attacker claims in, in this hello that uh, he already seen in the past uh, an hello from uh, the victim. This is indicated in the, in the neighbor field. Now, the victim gets this hello and uh, simply believes it and adds the new neighbor to the list, decides to set up an adjacency uh, with the attacker, since uh, we assume here that uh, the victim is a designated router. The attack is launched on a designated router. And he starts the database exchange uh, process. And so he sends out his database description packet, claiming to be the master with some uh, initial sequence number. Uh, the, the message will not be received by the attacker since the attack is uh, located remotely and uh, uh, the message is destined to uh, the phantom uh, IP address, just a fictitious IP address. So uh, it will not uh, be received by uh, the attacker, but the attacker doesn't really care. He just can send out his database description uh, uh, packet claiming to be the master, the MS flag is set, with a totally different uh, sequence number, not related to the sequence number chosen by the victim. Now, since the attacker chose to himself an ID that is larger than the victim, he will be chosen as the master. This means that the next uh, uh, sequence uh, um, the, for the remaining of the, the exchange, the, the, the attacker will be the master, and the victim will be the slave of the exchange, uh, which means that throughout the exchange, uh, the, uh, the victim will use the sequence number chosen by the attacker. This is why the attacker doesn't really have to see all the database descriptions sent by the, by the victim. So there are a few points about the database descriptions of the, the attacker. First, uh, in this attack, uh, we assume that uh, the attacker sends out just uh, empty database descriptions, no LSA summaries. It doesn't have to be that way, but uh, it will, ma will uh, make the life of the attacker easier later on, as we will see. And secondly, um, he has now to know when the, the victim stops sending uh, or finish, has finished sending its LSA summaries uh, to the phantom router. Now, he doesn't really know when uh, this event occurs, since he actually does not, don't see the database description packets of, uh, of the victim. But this does not really matter. It does not have to pinpoint exactly the, the exact time in which the, uh, the victim uh, finished sending out all its LSA uh, summaries because uh, it just have to uh, upper bound this uh, number, the number of database descriptions which are, uh, are used by the, the victim. If he overshoots this number and assumes that the, he needs uh, more uh, database description packets than he actually needs, then the attacker, then the victim will just keep sending database descriptions, packets which are empty. So it doesn't really matter when the actual, uh, uh, the actual point in which the victim uh, finished uh, sending all its LSA summaries. So uh, the attacker can just uh, simply up or bound this number. By the way, note that uh, the attacker and the victim reside on the same autonomous system. So pretty much uh, the LSA database of both um, are uh, pretty identical, so uh, this means that uh, the attacker can uh, reasonably or uh, approximately know w how many database descriptions uh, the victim will, uh, will need uh, in order to send all its L LSA summaries. But in, again, this uh, upper bound doesn't have to be uh, um, um, precise. So 
let's say the, uh, this upper bound, the, the number of database descriptions that are sent by the attacker, for example, it shows N. So he, he sends out it, the last database description packet. Notice that uh, the N flag is, uh, is down here. And uh, now once the victim gets the, this message, we assume that already he sent out all, it, all uh, the LSA summaries he needed. So he sees that uh, actually the phantom router now has an empty uh, database of LSAs. Okay, doesn't bother him. But uh, the point here that he doesn't really now have to uh, ask from the phantom uh, new LSA that he might, that he might uh, receive, that uh, he wants to receive. So this means that at this point, this exact point, the victim will now uh, enter the full state, meaning he has completed, uh, completely uh, completed the adjacency with the phantom router, and he now thinks that he is fully adjacent with a phantom router that does not really exist on the network. And at this point, the victim will now send out uh, LSA on behalf of the network that connects, that connected, uh, connected back to the attacker. Okay, now let's see some uh, possible applications of the, this attack and how, uh, what can be done by the attacker itself uh, using this tool. Uh, let's say this is our autonomous system. We have the, vict the attacker up there, and we have a, a subnet down here. And uh, let's say the, the attacker's goal is to black hole the entire traffic in the autonomous system destined to this uh, subnet. So let's see what can the attacker can do. For example, now we can set up a false, uh, uh, excuse me, a phantom router on the left side of the autonomous system. Oh, this is the normal routes to the subnet. So now we can set up the phantom router um, on the left side of the autonomous system while having this phantom router advertise an LSA that as if it was connected to this uh, stub uh, network. And um, now all the routers which are closer to this, the phantom router will reroute the traffic uh, to the phantom, uh, meaning that, that actually the, the traffic will be black holed. Now the routers on the right side are not affected, but this can be handled very easily by setting up another uh, phantom router on the right side of the autonomous system. And the attacker can just uh, move on and uh, uh, um, set up more and more phantom routers uh, on the autonomous system. Uh, at will, as needed, until all the autonomous system traffic uh, destined to this uh, subnet is black holed. Now, notice that a uh, few things. Um, well, first, um, the attacker is not linked to the crime scene. The attacker does not reside on the left side, the, the network on the left side. It does not reside on the network uh, on the right side. So uh, the network administrator will have uh, pretty much a hard time to uh, pinpoint uh, the attacker. And in addition to that, this attack is totally flexible. Uh, at the same ease, he uh, set up in a phantom router. He can just tear it down and make him disappear. And for example, uh, make the phantom router appear for half a minute and then uh, tear it down and set up another phantom router somewhere else in the autonomous system and then tear it down and have other after a half a minute and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is a very flexible attack in which the, the attacker can play around uh, with the... Uh, uh, with the traffic and actually make the network, administra admi network administrator pretty crazy. Let's uh, see even another uh, potential uh, application which is even more powerful. Now, what if we um, set up a phantom router and connect it, um, uh, the same phantom router, to do uh, uh, networks which are in opposite uh, sides of the autonomous system, like this? Uh, suddenly, the phantom router now has a, looks like a very desirable uh, shortcut uh, in the autonomous system, as if it was a wormhole uh, in the autonomous system, and now a lot of traffic will be diverted through it and actually black holed. Um, and this is a very uh, powerful attack. We simulated the, the attack uh, on uh, real ISP topologies and found out that if the attacker chooses wisely the networks the phantom router will be connected to, it can actually black hole uh, more than 50% of the traffic in the autonomous system. Just 50% of the traffic in the autonomous system will disappear by this uh, simple attack, and that's it. Again, 
as, as before, the attacker is way up here. It does not reside on the left side uh, uh, a network, nor on the right side network. Uh, it, can, it is very hard for the, attack, for the network administrator uh, to, tra to pinpoint uh, the attacker. So this was the attack. Now, there are some assumptions and caveats to this attack, which ma makes it uh, a little weaker. First, uh, as I said, the attacker, uh, the, it, we assume that the attacker assumes that all the shared secret uh, in the, on the autonomous system is, uh, is equal. This is indeed the, the case for, ma for many autonomous systems, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, we have to assume that since the, uh, the packets sent by the, uh, victim, uh, by the attacker to the victim router are sent in a unicast way, uh, um, explicitly to the victim. So we have to know the, the shared secret uh, on the remote uh, link that is attached to the victim. Another caveat is that the adjacency must be maintained uh, every 40 seconds. If we want to make the, the attack persistent for more than 40 uh, se uh, seconds, we have to send out another uh, hello message, which means that uh, in order to let the victims uh, know that the phantom is still uh, alive. This is done just every 40 seconds. The hello message is pretty much the, the same uh, first hello message you've seen in the attack sequence. And the last uh, caveat is that uh, once the victim receives an LSA, he now floods it to all its neighbors. That includes the, the phantom LSA, the phantom uh, router. And he expects now an acknowledgement, but the phantom isn't there to uh, be received, to uh, send the, this acknowledgement. So the acknowledgement will never uh, be, in a minute, uh, will never uh, be received by the attacker, uh, by, by the victim. Uh, in, in, uh, in principle, this attack does not, uh, does not uh, make any, uh, um, it's, uh, this caveat uh, does not uh, make any difference since the, uh, uh, the victim router simply will send out uh, the LSA endlessly and retransmit the LSA to the phantom router, that's it. But, uh, however, we noted that uh, in Cisco router gives up af after 125 uh, seconds and then turns down, the, turns down the, adjacen the adjacency. Now, there is a possible solution to this caveat since uh, the attacker itself resides on the, autonomous, uh, the same autonomous system. So if, the, uh, so if the attacker receives an LSA, so it can safely assume that uh, the LSA has been received uh, by, the, uh, by the victim or will be shortly received by the victim. Now that means that they uh, can send out, it has a, a window of 120 seconds to send out uh, an acknowledgement on behalf of the um, uh, phantom router. Yes, uh, there, there was uh, one question there. Yes. Okay, so how does this, this affect the, the attack? Well, it appears to pinpoint the attack, I can see in transmission an LSA route on the router instead of just being layer two adjacent. Uh, there is no, um, in this attack, uh, I hadn't sent, uh, I haven't uh, sent uh, uh, LSA uh, remotely here, at least here. Okay, so it um, doesn't really uh, affect here the, the attack. If, if I could, if an ACL is configured on the network to, to block uh, forwarding of the LSA, would it prevent that attack? Um, here, no. Again, because uh, no LSAs are sent uh, remotely. Okay? So let's uh, now. Uh, continue with uh, the much more powerful uh, attack, uh, which is named the disguised LSA. Here, the vulnerability is as follows. Two different instances of an LSA are considered uh, identical by the router if they have the same exact uh, uh, fields. The sequence number, checksum, and age. Well, the age has a plus or minus uh, 15 minutes range. And the actual payload is not uh, considered. This means that if there are two different LSAs with totally different links in them, they can be still considered by a router identical, 
if they have this same uh, three fields, the checksum, uh, sequence number, and age. That's interesting, and um, let's, say, let's see how uh, an attacker can exploit uh, this, uh, this vulnerability. Uh, the attacker can advertise a false LSA um, on behalf of a victim router while disguising it, the false LSA to a valid um, uh, to a valid LSA. This has the remarkable benefit that uh, if the victim router will now get uh, this disguised LSA, it will simply ignore it and regard, this, regard it as a duplicate of, uh, of the valid LSA he uh, recently originated. So no fight back. That's a, a very good thing for the attacker. But there is a problem with this naive uh, implementation of the attack since all other routers will also regard this disguised LSA to be a duplicate of the victim of the valid LSA. So um, uh, therefore they will not install the, the disguised LSA in the database, so no effect. So we have to uh, solve this problem. And, uh, let's, and the solution is that uh, the attacker will send out uh, a disguised L uh, an LSA that is disguised on behalf uh, or, uh, this, that is disguised to the next valid instance of the LSA. Okay, to the next valid instance, not the current one. So if, in principle, uh, we can send out the disguised LSA just flooded throughout uh, the, the network, then all the routers will, um, uh, will install the LSA since it is uh, disguised to the next valid instance of uh, the valid LSA. Um, and uh, if uh, simultaneously the, the next valid instance will be also uh, sent out, then when the disguised LSA will reach the, the victim LSA, it will uh, uh, regard it as a duplicate and it will not, uh, um, and no fightback will ever occur. Now, this is kind of complicated. It sounds very compli uh, complicated. How do we know when exactly the next valid LSA will be uh, transmitted and you have to send it at exactly the same time? It sounds very... Uh, but uh, there is a solution to this problem. What if we can trigger the next valid instance of the attack of the victim uh, of the valid LSA to be originated using a fightback? This is uh, this is uh, the really easy uh, uh, solution to this problem. Just trigger the next valid instance. So let's see an example of how the attack can uh, work. This is just an illustration, a, a simple toy example of uh, um, of the attack, just to let you know uh, the basics of the attack. But uh, I will show you in the next few slides uh, a more uh, realistic, uh, practical approach to this. This is how just uh, now just to show you the, the, the principles of the attack. So let's say we have two, uh, uh, two routers, the victim and its neighbor, R2. So uh, the remote attack can send out an LSA. This is, uh, at this point, indeed, the LSA is a transmitted uh, unicast the, in remote way to the, uh, to the victim uh, uh, router, but as we will next see uh, in the next slide, uh, it, cannot, it does not have to be that way, and uh, we'll show you this in the next slide. So let's say for these purposes, for this simple example, um, the, uh, a spoofed LSA, a false LSA, is sent out directly uh, to R1. This is called the, the uh, trigger LSA, which the sole purpose of it is to simply piss off the, uh, the victim and make him send out uh, a correcting LSA, the fightback LSA. At the same time, the router sends out a disguised LSA um, of R1, uh, disguised himself uh, to the next, uh, to the future fightback uh, R1 is about to send out, which have, having the same sequence, checksum, and age um, of the future fightback. Now, when uh, the, the trigger LSA is received by R1, it will immediately send out a fightback LSA, which will be received by R2, and it will reject it as a duplicate of the disguised LSA just received. In the meantime, simultaneously, R2 will also send, uh, will uh, reflood the disguised LSA to all its neighbor. This includes the, uh, the R1, and um, R1 will get the, the disguised LSA, and again, will reject it as a duplicate of the fightback it just originated. So at this point, we actually have a persistent uh, state in which R1 and R2 now possesses 
two different copies of R1 LSA. R1 having the valid uh, content, the valid LSA, and R2 having a totally different uh, LSA. And this, again, this state is persistent. No more fightbacks, and uh, it just remains uh, that way. Okay, so let's uh, review how an attacker can craft this uh, disguised LSA. The first uh, step is to uh, make the edge, uh, the edge field the same. This is the easiest one. We just have to make sure that uh, the disguised LSA is uh, sent out within a 15 minute time range uh, of the fightback LSA. This is, of course, very easy to do and uh, yeah, this is done. The next one is the sequence number. Again, very easy because we know that uh, the sequence number of the fightback LSA is also always incremented by one as compared to, uh, to the trigger LSA. This means that we have to send out the disguised LSA with a sequence number that is incremented by one as compared uh, to the trigger LSA. Again, very easy. Um, the hardest feat here is to uh, make sure that uh, our disguised LSA has the same is uh, computes to the same check, checksum as the fightback LSA, as the future uh, fightback LSA. But this is not that hard uh, because first you have to realize that uh, the content of the fightback LSA is predictable and deterministic. So actually, uh, since all the links of the, the victim usually remains the same, they, uh, they are not changed uh, very rapidly, and also the header of the LSA uh, is also very predictable, this means that the checksum of the fightback LSA is also very predictable. So we, have, we know how to compute the target uh, checksum value. This is the first stage. So how do we actually um, uh, make our disguised LSA compute, uh, be computed to the, the, to the checksum? So we take the false uh, LSA we want to transmit. We add, it, we add to it uh, a dummy link, a dummy link entry. Uh, and the purpose uh, uh, for this dummy link entry is to set its content in, in such a way that the entire checksum of the LSA will be computed uh, to the target checksum uh, we want it to. And uh, now this can be done very easily since remember the checksum is only a 16-bit result of a linear calculation and the link entry has some 64 bits of uh, free bits that we can freely uh, set. And they can be anything. So we can actually calculate back for, from the checksum, from the target checksum, what, what is the, uh, the desirable uh, content of this uh, link, uh, dummy link entry. Or um, if you are not that good in math, uh, you can just uh, brute force it. Uh, it's only 16 bits. Just uh, try uh, a lot of uh, uh, values for the link entry and just uh, and within a t two or three seconds, you will eventually uh, get uh, this uh, checksum. So we have now the disguised LSA having the same exact age sequence and checksum as the future fightback. Okay, so now let's see uh, some realistic application of this attack. Um, let's say now that uh, the attacker is up there and the victim is down there. And uh, now we, the attacker wants to spoof uh, or falsify the LSA um, of that victim. Again, in a persistent way um, that uh, will last uh, very long. And now uh, the, the attack is, is simply the following. The attacker will send out, will uh, flood uh, the trigger LSA, and after it, it will, it will flood uh, the disguised LSA on its local uh, link. Not, it will not send it uh, in unicastly, but just on its local link. So notice that uh, the trigger LSA will be marked in uh, black, and the disguised LSA will be marked in red. So here, here it goes. So uh, the, the, the attacker will uh, trigger now the two LSAs. Here you see the trigger, and then after it, uh, the, the disguised LSA. Um, as the trigger makes its way, make, uh, flooded throughout uh, the network, um, the trigger is installed in the database of each and every router. After it comes the disguised LSA, because he has, now because he has a, a higher sequence number, uh, the disguised LSA will run over the trigger LSA and it will also be installed on the, 
in the routers database. All the red uh, routers you see here actually installed the disguised LSA. Now at this point, the trigger LSA uh, is received by the victim, which means it, it will now spit out the, the fightback LSA to all its neighbors, like so. Meanwhile, uh, the victim will now uh, receive uh, the disguised uh, LSA. And this means that uh, and it will uh, simply ignore it and uh, trigger it as a duplicate of the fightback it just received, it just sent. Um, meanwhile, the fightback will be received by, uh, by the, these two uh, routers up there. And uh, these two routers will also ignore the fightback uh, because it is a duplicate, uh, supposedly a duplicate, of, uh, uh, of the disguised LSA they just installed in their database. So we have here a, a persistent state in which the attacker falsified an LSA of another router in a persistent way without actually uh, causing the fightback to uh, be flooded uh, throughout uh, the network. Now, point, uh, point out that, uh, I would like to point out that uh, the trigger as well as the disguised LSA are flooded locally on the, in the autonomous system, in the, on the local link of the, uh, of the attacker. This means that it doesn't really have to know any of the shared uh, uh, secrets of other links, or uh, maybe an ACL of another uh, router will stop him. This is not the case. Just a regular flooding of, uh, of an LSA. Now notice here that uh, the attacker uh, does not always uh, manage to, uh, to poison uh, all the routers in the autonomous system. For example, this router down there uh, was not poisoned. This is because uh, um, every uh, path from the attacker to that router uh, traverses that, uh, the victim. So um, it, uh, the attacker cannot uh, manage to get uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this router. In practice, um, we have actually a race between the disguised LSA and the fightback LSA. Uh, the LSA which reaches first to, the, to a router wins. This, the, the second one will be regarded as a duplicate, uh, which means that uh, the disguised, if the, router, if the attacker wants to poison a lot of, a lot of uh, routers, he has to make sure that the disguised LSA reaches it before the fightback. Now, this race, uh, in this race, the attacker has the upper hand. The disguised LSA has the upper hand. Notice that uh, the disguised LSA was triggered way before the fightback LSA. So uh, indeed, uh, it has a lot of uh, um, uh, time uh, to propagate uh, in the network before the fightback LSA uh, starts, uh, uh, is originated. So in, and indeed, we simulated uh, this attack on uh, real ISP topologies. And uh, in almost 100% of the cases, uh, the attacker is able to poison, poison the LSA of a, of a victim router for more than 80% of the, of the other routers in the, uh, in the autonomous system, which is a pretty, uh, pretty high number. And this way, it can just, um, this way the attacker can just falsify the LSA of all the other routers in the autonomous system and actually get a complete control over the, uh, of the, route, of the, the routing process in the autonomous system just by, from a single router. And that's it. So um, validation of the attacks. As I said, the attacks, as I said, uh, uh, the attacks are actually based on a theoretical analysis of the OSPF uh, protocol. Uh, but we verified it successfully against Cisco's iOS uh, 1501M, which is the latest stable release of iOS uh, on a 7200 series router. And uh, the proof of concept scripts are, uh, sh should be in your uh, conference CD. It's written in SCAPI, so have fun with it and uh, play with it and uh, uh, disguise the LSA with it. Um, so in, to conclude, uh, the common conception until now was that uh, a router, an attacker inside the autonomous system, uh, uh, even if he knows uh, the shared secret uh, in the, on the autonomous system, doesn't really, uh, cannot really uh, falsify the routing tables of other routers. As you have seen, uh, these attacks actually shattered this uh, conception. And what it basically means that if an attacker 
uh, controls a single router, a single arbitrary router in the autonomous system. It actually controls the router, the routing process in the entire autonomous system. This is the whole point of the, this presentation, to show you uh, that uh, a single attack, a single router can actually control the entire uh, auto, uh, routing in the autonomous system. So, and that's it. Uh, any questions? Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, uh, we've approached uh, Cisco and Juniper about this, and they acknowledge the, the seriousness of the problem. But uh, they said that uh, since this is the actual uh, problem with the, the RFC, so this is the in the ball, in the in the hands of the ITF. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not catching it. <laughs> yes, uh, if uh, the OSPF protocol would, uh, would be different in somehow, to pay attention to this, uh, for example, to pay attention to the content of the LSA, this attack would not uh, exist because uh, the, the router only pay attention to these three fields. Uh, we, we are able to disguise the LSA. This would require a change to the protocol, yes, because uh, and it would require a very uh, delicate change because we want to have it uh, backward compatible to other routers who do not implement. Uh, this change. So uh, indeed, uh, a protocol change is necessary here. And it has to be worked out in some way to be backward compatible. Yes? No, just uh, uh, not every 15 minutes, just uh, once, and that's it. No more fight back, no more, nothing uh, will ever occur now. The only event in which uh, this uh, reverts the situation, as I said, it, the, uh, each router periodically advertised a new fresh instance of the LSA every half an, half an hour. So indeed, after, after half an hour, um, the LSA will, uh, the attack will have to be reinitiated. But this is half an hour, it's a very long time. Yes. Please uh, speak up. Hmm. What would it look like? Um, well, it will look like as if uh, uh, that the the router thinks very uh, bizarre uh, uh, things about the autonomous system topology which are not true. The autonomous system topology is one, and what the router thinks is the other, and it starts doing berserk, berserk uh, things uh, with uh, its routing table. Um, the, the, LSADB, the LSADB of the router uh, is not, uh, will not be uh, the correct one. This is the first uh, step uh, you can take. Just take a look at the LSADB and make sure that indeed um, this is uh, in line, in sync, with uh, the autonomous system topology, the real autonomous system topology as you know it. And this is actually the surefire way uh, to know uh, if you've been attacked by this, uh, by the disguised LSA uh, uh, attack. Yes. Um, actually, I wouldn't know that. No, uh, no, uh, no. no. Um, uh, notice that the fight back is not, is not uh, considered a security event in OSPF, just uh, an operational, operational event. Um, uh, the, the router, when it sees uh, a false LSA, 
he regards it uh, as a stale uh, LSA. He might, he might have uh, uh, sent out uh, previously before the, the last reboot or something. So uh, it generally is not regarded as a security event. But then again, I don't know what uh, Cisco does with its logs. Yes? What attack, excuse me? Ah, uh, false uh, remote uh, adjacency? Right. Okay. He does not require an LSA? Yes. Just hello and database description messages. That's it. Excuse me? Yes, just, yes, yes, just the hello and database description messages. That's what the attacker sends out. And that's it. Uh, once the, this, the attack is, is finished, now the designated router, the victim, does all the work and now sends out uh, an LSA with a non existing link to the phantom router. And the LSA of the phantom router does not necessarily have to be unicasted to the victim. Uh, it can be just flooded locally by the attacker and it just propagated uh, throughout the autonomous system. That's it. No uh, unicast LSA is here. Again, uh, sorry, again. No, it doesn't have to be a router, a actual router. It just has to uh, send out uh, this OSPF messages I, I uh, shown uh, earlier. It just has, the, attack, the attacker has the, needs to have the ability to send out this false hello and database description messages which can be uh, processed by the victim router. That's it. It doesn't have to be a real router. This is just for the purposes of the demonstration here. Yes. This is what, what I used for, uh, to, uh, to check for the attacks against Cisco. Yes. Just the directly connected the uh, MD5 shared secret. Yes, this is. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much.